energy in this room is so wonderful. Thank you for being amazing, not only looking people, but more importantly, <laughs> kind people. I can feel it, and I'm here for it, so thank you. My name is, hold on, my name is Christina Nuenska. I'm the executive director here at The Green Space, so welcome. Can I see a show of hands for folks that are here for the first time? What? Welcome, hi! You can go to our website, www.thegreenspace.org, to learn more about our programs and give us money. <laughs> Thank you so much. Here at The Green Space, we like to say that we channel the collective genius of New York City to create forward-looking live art, theater, and journalism. Why journalism? Because we are part of WNYC. And WNYC is part of New York Public Radio, which is public media. Who believes in public media? <laughs> Praise whoever you praise, because we do too. And um, we're particularly excited tonight because we are here for Aphrodite. But before we go deep into that, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about things that are coming up at the Green Space very quickly. So, when you leave tonight and go on Charlton, there is a multimedia installation in the window by an amazing artist collective called Pie Hole. That is their name. <laughs> One word, Pie Hole. And they have done an installation that was, um, it was 21 days leading up to the winter, winter solstice, and it stars a grumpy mouse narrated by Brian Lehrer, <laughs> who, as our executive producer Jennifer will say, is not grumpy. But it's so lovely, and it's so wonderful, and you, will, you need to see it, because tonight's the last night that you can see it. And we had, I don't know, I'm exaggerating, 300, maybe really like 100, but 300 <laughs> people on the sidewalk like a Saks Fifth Avenue unveiling. <laughs> it was amazing because there's a shortage of windows in the city and we are here to help. <laughs> on January 26th, we're gonna have La Brega, our podcast about experiences in Puerto Rico. For those of you who know about La Brega, thank you. It is a project we do with Fortura Media and um, is well supported by Melon. It's gonna be a dance party. So come, please, f uh, January 26th, we're gonna have Balloon and DJ Christian Martir. Am I saying that correctly? Thank God. And it's a night of music and dancing, so please come. And then Friday, January 27th, right the next day, you can come back, we'd love to see you. We're launching a whole new show with this amazing woman, Thorgy Thor, who is a performance artist and violinist. You might know her. We have a major Thorgy Thor fan. and. <laughs> She's really gonna, essentially, you know what we wanna do? We want classical music to be accessible. And Thor D. Thor is an amazing drag queen that you might have seen on RuPaul's Drag Race, who's an accomplished violinist. And so let's like take the stuffy out, stop the crazy, let's have fun, and she's just gonna show us how to do that. It's gonna be brilliant. Then on February 8th, as part of this series, Wanderlust Wednesday, we're gonna have Black Girl, You've Been Gentrified, which is gonna be a live reading of a podcast that is in process about this amazing black woman realtor who's selling expensive homes in Brooklyn to wealthy white people while trying to struggle to pay for her children to go to private school. Girl, you've been gentrified, so come out. <laughs> and we're gonna have Kimberly Drew on the panel alongside Michaela Angela Davis. So good things, people, good things. However, tonight we are here for Ask Aphrodite, advice on of love and copper featuring performance artist Marissa Moranjan. And let me tell you, I love this lady. She is amazing. I moved to the United States in 2005, March. I met Marissa like October 2005, one of the first artists I met here. And she has left an, Im an impression on me that will just be forever feeding and I just, think you're incredible, and I'm excited that we're working together, but she's Aphrodite now, so she can't speak to me. <laughs> so 
You'll hear from experts like Sarah Dahman, an award-winning writer and coppersmith, Dave Maiulo, educator and physicist, and Chikako Takashida, a professor of gender and sexuality studies, and they're gonna tell you all the things that you're gonna do. But in advance of that, I wanna invite a friend on stage to tell you a little bit about the work that they did with uh, Marissa on this project, the executive director, Justine Ludwig of Creative Time. Justine. Thank you. Hi everyone. What a, you're right. What an amazing group of people. This is such a treat. <laughs> um, I'm Justine Ludwig. I'm the executive director of Creative Time. Creative Time is a nearly 50-year-old socially engaged arts organization based here in New York City, and we are known for our ambitious commissions that address the most pressing issues of our time, from Kara Walker's A Subtlety in the Domino Sugar Factory, to Pedro Reyes's Democracy at the Brooklyn Army Terminal, and most recently, Charles Gaines's Moving Chains, which is currently installed on Governor's Island and will be reopening to the public in March. I hope you join us. We are also known for our summit, a convening of thinkers, dreamers, and doers working at the intersection of art and politics. Marissa Moran John was part of our last summit titled Speaking Truth, where we posed the question, can speaking truth to power unravel the age of disillusion that we are finding ourselves in? A question we are still asking ourselves four years later. Marissa's presentation, which is closely related to tonight's event, took place in a section titled health and gender. At the same event, she presented The Snatural Chapel, an installation in collaboration with Rafi Siegel. And I've been thinking about this performance ever since. Now, on to Aphrodite, goddess of love and copper. It feels like copper has been interwoven in my life. As a child, I used it as part of a regimen to break a cycle of debilitating and seemingly unending ear infections, and I remember believing that copper was magic. It was truly a blessing. And now, for quite some time, I've relied on copper for my own bodily autonomy, another blessing, especially in this moment. Both times, copper offered me a freedom that I had been previously denied. During the pandemic, creative time, worked on a project with the artist Jill Maggid called Tender, where she engraved on the edges of 120,000 2020 pennies the text, the body was already so fragile, and then introduced all those pennies into the economy. The use of copper pennies as a medium was deeply intentional, calling upon the antimicrobial qualities of this chemical element. Copper arises time and time again to save the day. Aphrodite, goddess of love and copper, thank you for these blessings. And Marissa Moran John and Christina Newman Scott, thank you for the honor of speak letting me speak briefly and be part of this event tonight. Oh, how great that will be. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to share a little bit about Marissa's background and then we're going to hand it right over to Aphrodite. Marissa Jean works across media from small scale to performance, writing to architecture, and for her, storytelling becomes a way to suture these gaps. She creates public art and creative media with and about immigrants, women, and working families. Working with historically underserved and underrepresented communities means that stories matter. They dignify and make visible individuals and the communities they represent. But Marissa asks us to think about the borders between art and journalism by blurring them. On the one hand, she rigor rigorously researches and fact checks her work, such as in this project, which involves extensive research and direct interviews with communities and experts. But she also uses gesture, imagery, humor, and personae, demanding us to think about things in a new way from a new angle. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Aphrodite. So first, thank you so much for the Creative Time teams, the team here at WNYC. And uh, the music tonight is by Breezy Nix, a.k.a. Marika Yorsma, who is a NASA engineer and, s and um, designer who made this track using her own homemade uh, synthesizer and motherboard, <coughs> which uses copper to relay the digital signals. And FYI, the beer and wine that you, the adult beverages that you are drinking has copper in them. Um, you know, thank you to you all for coming. 
I, and th thank you so much, Christina, for suggesting that we meet again. I mean, I have to say, you know, it's since we met last, it's been a little bit hard for me. I mean, I know we've had some misunderstandings on, uh, on my part. I mean, I should apologize. Maybe there's some basic things I should have said about myself. I mean, I am a goddess, and you are a... <laughs> no. Uh, a mortal. And certainly there are things that you couldn't possibly have known about me, so I thought I'd share a little bit about my origins and where I'm coming from. As you know, I am Aphrodite, the goddess of love, but also of copper. And in the West, people like to say I was first mined 10,000 years ago on the island of Cyprus, whose name comes from the Latin word cuprum. And there I existed in abundance. And you might recognize our shared alchemical symbol, perhaps suggesting a relationship of fecundity. Originally in antiquity, the symbol was meant to resemble a hand mirror, but back then, would have been made from copper or polished bronze. And while some assume that the mirror symbolizes vanity, others know that a mirror's ability to reflect also symbolizes a revelatory power and inner secret. And while the West claims my origins are for Cyprus, actually I'm everywhere in the world and I am up in you. Your body, <laughs> your body needs and desires me. But above five milligrams a day, I weaken you and I already course through your veins. And for some of you, I met may re even regulate your heart. Does anybody have a pacemaker? But I might even be in your snatch, enabling <laughs> libidinal pleasure. Raise your hand if you bought your copper IUD. <laughs> Congratulations, you are one of the 170 million women around the world with an IUD. For those of you who haven't seen one, we just can't show you ours. <laughs> um, this one has never been inside anybody, but uh, here, can you take it and pass it around? The copper in this one probably comes from Bingham Mine, which is outside of Salt Lake City, which provides 3% of the U.S.'s copper. And raise your hand if anyone's curious about how an IUD actually works. Okay, good. So the scientific community says it works in two ways. First, copper naturally exchanges ions, which is what makes copper so conductive. And it's this ionic exchange that zaps the, tail <laughs> the tails <laughs> off the sperm so they can't swim to the egg and fertilize it. It prevents pregnancy 99% of the time. There's that 1% exception. And if by some accident the sperm does fertilize the egg, the copper creates a generally inhospitable environment inside the uterus and it preventing the fertilized egg from implanting in the walls of the uterus. Got it? <laughs> Quiz later. Now raise your hand if, does anybody here have a pessary? So it's, it's a device that supports your uterus and when it's made of copper or a copper alloy like bronze, it acts as a contraceptive like an IUD. And this one here dates from 200 to 400 CE. Uh, this one is a washer from the hardware store that I spray painted and the <laughs> sandpaper. But I'll, I'll pass it around and it'll work as a placeholder. <laughs> So, now, there are other ways that I regulate and enable your desires. Raise your hand if you used a dating app to set up tonight's hot date. Tinder? Tinder? Anybody else? J-date? Well, look, you used a motherboard that depends on copper to relay digital signals. Yes, yes, my friend, you are a networked being. 
in a digital era. You rely on me to scatter and distend you throughout the world. You see, I am at the center, enabling your libidinal fulfillment and digital selves. And yes, sure, there are many other precious metals and minerals inside your devices, but inside, in fact, the world still relies on me. I am still described as civilization's necessary evil, unquote. The demand for copper is the first indicator of an economic upturn. It means people are building homes, industries, electronics, consumer products, and civic infrastructures. You see, you depend on me. You need me so bad. And baby, I need you. I mean, I don't know how things went so awry. I mean, not to place blame. But I feel like perhaps in a relationship you were looking for intimacy. Whereas I think it's much more apt for us to frame our relationship in terms of extimacy. <laughs> Drawing on a term coined by the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, Sherry Turkle defines extimacy as a technological mediation of intimacy. Like how you two are sexting each other right now. But I suggest that we cannot think about technology without thinking about its materiality, where it came from, its manufacture. In other words, extimacy as the technological and mineralogical mediation of intimacy. In other words, I am always at the center. Because when we don't acknowledge our origins, things go astray. I mean, I feel like I've been patient, if not enabling. You've been helping yourself to my abundance for the past 10,000 years to build your cities, your homes, your computers. And these days I'm not just so easy to possess, I'm just not lying around in the crust anymore. Today, I reside deep within the earth, and to possess me, you have to excavate volumes and volumes of ore to yield the same amount which creates more unusable stuff, or tailings. And even in the best mines, like Bingham, where the copper from our IUD is from, even there, only 3% of the entire excavated material will be refined into usable copper. The rest of the unusable stuff, or tailings, leaches into the water for decades after. And according to the Environmental Protection Agency, the runoff from the tailing ponds have polluted 40% of America's waterways. Polluted by copper, the Yankee Doodle Tailings Pond in Montana has the same acidity as your stomach. It's a case example of corporate and government failure on multiple levels. Following is a clip of how your taxpayer do dollars are mitigating this Yankee Doodle travesty. Montana Resources is taking steps to keep waterfowl out of the Berkeley pit in Butte. They say they don't want to see more birds killed by the toxic water like they did two years ago. MTN's John Amy takes us to the pit to show us how drone technology is being used to keep birds away. By air and water. Officials are using any means to avoid what happened at the Berkeley pit in November of 2016 when more than 10,000 migrating snow geese landed in the toxic water, leaving thousands to die. Montana Resources hired an operator to fly this drone to haze the birds out of the pit. We've made some significant modifications to it for uh, hazing of waterfowl at the Berkeley Pit. Uh, for instance, we've added extra radio antennas to it. We've added uh, flashing strobe lights with a visibility of three nautical miles and uh, loud audible piezoelectric sirens um, that produce a ear piercing sound that the birds find uncomfortable. MR also hired a contractor with the Atlantic Richfield Company who built this remote controlled boat that can quickly get the waterfowl out of the pit. The intent is to get up close enough that they can hear it, show the sides, let them hear the sound, start to get them agitated, 
and then maneuver to try to get them to lift up off the water. During this demonstration, they actually had some waterfowl land in the pit. There were two snow geese and a couple of common golden eye. Now they used the drones to chase these birds around, which proved to be a bit stubborn, but they eventually were able to get one of the snow geese to fly out of the contaminated water. They're very a different news source says that 30,000 birds died creating a sea of white carcasses floating on the surface of the water. So you see, we've heard a lot of people around us, those who live close to the mines, those who handle and refine me, those who in Catherine Yusuf's words absorb the body burdens of late capitalism. Over time, I will affect their breath, skin, and mental functioning until what seems most sovereign to them, their own body, becomes mine, but for them, other. I take over and begin to possess. And those who are overexposed to copper, as they say in the industry, have a greater likelihood of getting Wilson's disease. Their body becomes unable to expel copper and it begins to build up. The telltale signs are copper-colored eyes. And I don't know who this Wilson is, but I resent that he's taking all the credit while it's me who did all the work. <sighs> I'm, s I'm sorry. I know I get out of hand sometimes. We all do. Listen, we've gone too far, and things have gotten out of hand. After all, mineral, mineral extraction is a number one toxic emitter, is a number one dangerous industry, is a major contributor to climate change. I mean, it was stupid. It was, it was naive of me to think that we could move forward together. I mean, listen, this, is, this is just too much. It's, let's just call it quits for real this time. I mean, I'm just I'm feeling foolish. Ricardo, cut the, cut the lights. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know what we're going to do. I mean, fix this? Yeah. Fix this? I mean, you really think we could? Yeah. I mean, we'd have a long way to go before <laughs> we make our relationship healthier. <laughs> I mean, uh, you think... Yeah? yeah? I mean, maybe we could go see a professional. <laughs> I mean, maybe we could ask our friends and family to support us in building healthy relationships or something. I mean, I'd love to meet your buddy sometime. And I thought maybe you'd enjoy meeting some of mine. You know, we can get to get, you know, to know each other in that way. Yeah. Would you want to? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> David Mayulo is a scientist and educator who has performed in K through 12 schools and libraries, as well as National Geographic Network, Discovery Channel, The Weather Channel, American Museum of Natural History, NPR Science Friday, and Studio 360. Right here. He created, wrote, and starred in an off-Broadway pro off production, That Physics Show, with ran which ran from 2015 until the pandemic. And it may reopen again, so keep an eye out for it. <laughs> so a round of applause for David. <laughs> so Kanyua started us off by talking about copper's superpowers. Yeah, we <laughs> need to discuss those. But thank you so much for the invitation, Aphrodite. Oh, I do appreciate that. Of this course. Wonderful. So um, first, can you talk about copper and what makes me so special? Yeah, copper, <laughs> in thinking about it, copper as, a, as an element, as a metal, is actually the second best uh, conductor. If you had silver wires in your house, it would be a very different thing. That's the best conductor. But the second best is copper. So that's why we love it so much. In fact, Edison actually had his own <laughs> copper mine, and, uh, which is interesting enough until he decided it was too expensive to keep. 
But he, he knew right away that copper was a secret to electricity and magnetism, which is what we're going to see right here. A lot of the secrets to copper and why it works so well. Right. So start with this. Right, we, what we have right here is a copper wire, right? And copper is not just naturally magnetic or anything. It's not going to give us any kind of magnetism. However, if we do put a current through that wire, you'll see inside this magnet, it'll just jump. So once we have a current through the wire, well, it is magnetic. So we have a magnetic wire right there. And that's the start of all the secret. So knowing that, what we can do is show, here's a coil of copper, very large. And right here, it's hooked to a galvanometer. And this galvanometer actually can show us when we have a current through that coil. Well, there's no current now. But here's a strong magnet. If I take that strong magnet and put it through the coil, you'll note it actually makes us move. So we're having a current created just by moving the magne magnetic field through it. And that's the important part here. We're creating that magnetic field. I mean, we're creating that current right through here, just like that, by moving the magnet through it. Now, if we take the magnet, we just put it next to it, there's no actual activity. It has to move. And those are those flux lines that actually create the magnetic field. I mean, create the uh, current inside that coil, which is perfect. So if we move this coil over here and take away this wire, we can actually show that this coil of copper will give us the same magnetic field as that magnet. Now, if I move this coil towards it, we create a magnetic field again. If I turn it around, that current is going the other way. So back and forth, we're actually getting current through this coil from another coil. Again, we're building the magic of why electricity and magnetism is so, so dependent on copper and why we need it so. So thinking about it, here's a nice big chunk of copper. Beautiful piece, right? And uh, I had, oh, here it is right here. Here's a nice magnet, it's very strong. If I just put this on this piece of copper, let it go, you'll note it doesn't really want to move very fast. In fact, I can even make it roll down here, but it won't move very fast. And that's because as that magnetic field from this magnet interplays with the copper, we actually get a corresponding push back because there's eddy currents created inside this copper. Now, eddy currents are just little loops of current, and they actually have their own magnetic field. It always opposes the motion of the first magnet, which is hmm. part of you know, energy conservation in our universe. Well, maybe you do, but no one ever really gets something for nothing. We always have energy conservation. So basically, it's pushing back as that magnet tries to move down there. Okay. We also have this beautiful example. Could we put that image up here? Let's see where our big magnet is, actually. We might have to use the other one. Where'd he go? Oh, it's OK. What, we'll use that same magnet, and we're going to put it right through this very large copper tube Okay, right here. This was actually a wire used as a high energy physics um, experiment. The hole was actually used for coolant because we had so much current going through the copper that we actually had it, it heated up too much, so we had, a, had to add the uh, coolant to it. If I put this magnet in here, yeah, <laughs> and it always opposes the motion. That's the beauty of it. It always opposes the motion. So it floats down like a nice little astronaut or something. And so, oop, let's get that off of there. I'll do it a second time. Is that OK? So you can see the magic you have on our world, right like that. Now, <laughs> copper, <laughs> <laughs> copper is also really interesting in that that resistivity decreases quite a bit when we cool it. So here, I have a light bulb, and it's in series with a whole bunch of copper wire right here. If I cool this copper wire, Basically, if this gets more current, it's going to get brighter. So if I put this inside here, you'll note almost right away it's getting brighter. Now, what I'm dipping this into is liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen is probably about you know, minus 200 degrees centigrade, 
Uh, if you want to use the real scientific scale, it would be about 77 Kelvin. So it gets much brighter because we've cooled this, so now the resistivity is much lower. So it's, you know, it's beautiful. But let's combine that effect and that effect and use this. This is a one inch and uh, by six inch piece of copper. It's a nice big disc. And here is a very powerful magnet, okay? If I take this very powerful magnet, you'll note <laughs> it can't actually, yeah, it can't actually fall down onto it because there's so much pushback by this cool piece of copper. In fact, if I try to pull this up, you'll know that it tries to follow me up. So it doesn't really matter if it's going towards it or away. It always opposes the motion. I can spin this, and it just floats on down. So it's a beautiful effect, and it's a big secret to why, well, not really a secret, but one of the reasons why our world is so dependent on what you give us. So thank you. Thank you. So our next guest is Sarah Dahman, <coughs> who is an award-winning writer and founder of House Copper and Cookware, which she runs using tools from the 1700s and 1800s, but for us tonight, also Zoom. Her work has been featured in Forbes, Martha Stewart, Food and Wine, House Beautiful, PBS, and The Day Show. So we're going to cut to Sarah. Sarah, hi. Hello. What are you making? A copper cup. <laughs> you know, what you drink out of, but it needs a bottom or the copper, you know, doesn't hold water when it's empty <laughs> like that. But yeah, so this is where the magic happens on my end of, of your experience. You know, you, you put it in the earth, but we take it out and build usable things with it. So um, my first question is this. In your book, you write about how um, Copper and people have an exceptionally long, even romantic relationship. Can you say more? Yes. I, I, uh, first and foremost, people love their copper cookware. Um, but beyond that, um, it's, it's what we have loved, um, copper, for so many millennia, uh, not only for weapons, which was our first go-to, but for just general life use over time, pots and jewelry and statues on top of the mausoleum. You know, the, one of the seven wonders of the world was made out of a mixture of copper. Um, even tools here in Wisconsin, where I am, um, we find archaic fish hooks that predate our local indigenous tribes. They go back so far. We, we loved it, we used it, and we spread it around the world. Now, I have a question. We have a, um, an audience full of people from New York City. Raise your hand if you have a, if you live in an apartment. Raise your hand if you have a small kitchen. Raise your hand if you rely on Instapot as your, made, you know, your main way of cooking. So, um, copper cookware, what's the deal for our Instapot users? Why should we care? Well, I mean, Instapot is not oh, yeah, nice as a one stop. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I mean, copper is probably in your Instapot, so there's, you know, hope. But uh, <laughs> copper can be used for almost anything, too, just like an Instapot. But, I mean, hopefully Instapot is not a sponsor of this event, but eventually your Instapot will break. And um, fact, someday the electric won't work, or it'll be outdated, or our, you know, it just it will stop, um, and it'll go in a landfill because unless there's going to be a whole bunch of Instapot um, repair shops popping up, it's done. Uh, so copper, on the other hand, if you want to stock your kitchen with with 
even one or two pots of copper and uh, you know, it's going to be renewable. It's retinable. It's green. It will never need to go in a landfill for centuries of use. And so besides, you know, one or two copper pots that you can kind of use for everything from mac and cheese to fancy dinners that are, you know, out of a French cookbook, then you've got, you know, maybe a couple cast iron skillets and you're set for life. And so are your grandkids. Um, you know, if once we get copper to this stage where it's for your home, it never, it never does need to be wasteful and going in and killing birds. I mean, unless you chop a pot <laughs> at a bird. And <laughs> so, Sarah, tell us, what did the ancients know about copper? Oh, well, it doesn't rust, which is really helpful uh, for archaeologists, but also because it can be used forever. And we touched, you touched on it earlier, but they knew that it, it purified, it killed germs. It's, it's a contact killer, what we call a contact killer. So because of that exchange of electrons that you do, Aphrodite, it, uh, it doesn't allow germs to have babies. It's, it's like nature's IUD. And so when germs can't reproduce on the surface of copper, they die. And so the ancient people, that's once we stopped using copper for spears and we started using it for bowls and cups. If you were lucky, you had a cup that was made from some part of, of copper and it would, it would essentially purify what you were drinking over time. And so that's just one way that, that the Egyptians, for instance, would use copper. And uh, we should go back to that. Hence, you know, copper cups. <laughs> Uh, now, in r more recent history, there's something. Tell us about U.S. and copper. Uh, well, I, you know, we still have it. We've always had it. it obviously, the archaic tribes here uh, in prehistory were using it and mining it on the surface levels. But it is very hard to extract. It is difficult to refine and smelt. It's really uh, expensive, and it's really tricky to do environmentally friendly. And so we're kind of at a standstill now here in the US um, where we aren't manufacturing it in a lot of ways and we're not pulling it out of the earth the way that we used to. And you know, the hope is that the US will start to, uh, we've, we've been working on extracting metals from just the surface slag from, from mines that are defunct and have been defunct for 150 years we now can just pull the copper out of kind of the, the rock that's sitting on the surface and we don't need to worry about hurting the environment in the same way we had to in the past. That's the hope, that's the current trend and let's hope we do it because that would be awesome for the US and copper. Now, let's talk about thermal conductivity. So how well and fast metal conducts heat. You write that copper has, quote, superb, heat conductivity second only to silver why and when is That's this important true. for cooking well it's important because unless you have a ton of money you can't afford uh you know solid copper cookware i mean i i would love it but it would also you know i'd have to sell my house so if you have copper you have speedy cookware there's less energy expended to cook. So less time spent cooking because it's fast. It heats you know, your food fast. You need less heat to also cook fast and you're getting the same results. And so it's kind of a, a dual awesomeness where less time, lower heat, same results. And plus, because it's so conductive, you get precision cooking. So it's like cooking with a really fine paintbrush. You, you know, start and stop that heat and the copper reacts almost instantaneously to the exchange, the change in temperature that's being put on it. And so it's, you know, kind of a, a magic kitchen tool in that regard. You don't have to wait for it to heat up or wait for it to cool down. Now, you are the U.S.'s only known woman coppersmith. And I'm wondering, do you think that you bring a different perspective to coppersmithing and why is this important? Probably the first thing is I overshare. I, co <laughs> over, I communicate a lot, which is why I'm here. But I mean, I do think that that might be possibly a generalized trait of 
female womanhoodness we like to talk a lot. Um, maybe it's just me and my Polishness, who knows. But, you know, here I am today. Women bring a new perspective because we, in the past, it was a very male-oriented trade. It still is. And it was a secret trade. The dads pass it on to their kids and so on and so forth. And they were like, don't tell anyone the secrets of this trade. And that has been written about even. And I am not that. I'm, you know, come here, let me teach you. And at the, at the same time, not only just that oversharing, but also um, it's a dying art. This trade is is almost dead. And the people that do do it were almost hunting for answers on how to do things as we're doing them because so much knowledge has been lost in just one and a half generations. It's really fast that we lose our hand knowledge. And so I'm hoping with women getting into the trade, you know, they can see it's possible, it's doable. And if we get more people in, then we can save it before it disappears. And that is, that's, you know, that's the hope anyway. My hope, my personal hope. I love your personal oversharing, and she really has an amazing Instagram page. What is your Instagram handle? House Copper. Now, my final question is this. On page 97 of your book, you write about how to care for your copper cookware, and you have a particular recipe about using a mixture of a sugar and rhubarb, rhubarb rub down. And I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about that. Yes, um, I'll give you a tiny bit of the backstory on that very quickly. It was an accident and an experimental thing that that happened, and that's how this ended up in the book. So the master tin and coppersmith I apprenticed under, Bob Bartlemy, uh, here in Wisconsin, he, we all do reenactments, rendezvous. We live like it's 1820, and it's living history, and you wear furs and leather and corsets, and you cook over a fire using tin and copper pots the way they used to. and he, of course, being a smith himself, would make copper utensils for cooking over the fire. And one day after breakfast, accidentally left the rhubarb and sugar mix that went over the, the pancakes for that day sitting on his copper spoon. And it completely shined, it, the, the copper went shiny. And he was like, that was interesting. And then like, brilliant, that's got to be another way to polish copper. And so then I did it in my house just to see, and it worked. And uh it was one of those accidental discoveries of, of rhubarb, sugar, and copper, and now it's in the book. So wow. now it can be remembered and not just a happenstance at a rendezvous that no one else would ever know otherwise. Thank you so much, Sarah. I am uh, your super fan. I know you have many super fans who are watching tonight. This is her uh, very amazing and accessible book. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So our next friend is Chikako Takeshita, who is an associate professor of gender and sexuality studies at UC Riverside. She's the author of The Global Biopolitics of the IUD, How Science Constructs Contraceptive Users and Women's Bodies. Um, Chikako, are you there? I'm here. Hello. Hi. Hi, Aphrodite. Am I on the screen? Not yet. Almost. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, hi, hi, audience. To get us going, how uh, how did the IUD come about? What is its origins? Can you tell us more? Sure. Um, so the origin of the modern IUD is in the 1960s, some elite American men who were afraid that if women in the global south kept reproducing at the rate that they they were, the, 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 the world will have too many people and that would lead to environmental and economics collapse, famine, political unrest, and maybe even um, nuclear war. So they were looking for some easy and cheap fertility control method that they wanted to um, basically impose on these women who they thought were overproducing. Uh, and they came across this IUD that was you know, used in the past for some time. Um, and they got really excited because they thought, okay, this is, this is something that you can apply to millions of women 
and just leave it there and have them stop reproducing for you know an indefinite amount of time and that's how the development of the iud started in the early 1960s and then um let's see uh so early on they had these flexible plastic that they were experimenting with they made devices in different shapes and sizes looking for some sort of a perfect design that would um, fit the uterus or occupy the uterus in some sort of ideal way uh, and prevent pregnancy. But uh, they soon got frustrated because none of the devices were working perfectly. When they were too small, they would allow too many pregnancies. When they were too big, it was so, sort of bulky and uncomfortable. And, and, and the angry uterus will start to bleed <laughs> or uh, complain about pain and it'll contract and expel the, the, the IUD and so forth. So in the late 1960s, they started looking for some sort of element that they can add to the IUD. And this is where you come in, Aphrodite, because, um, well, the way that they decided on adding the copper to the IUD is that one of the researchers in Chile called uh, Jaime Zipper, he did an experiment with a rabbit. So rabbits have multiple um, uteruses or multiple chambers in their uterus co called horns. And each bunny develops in different chambers. So Jaime Zipper, uh, attached wires made of silver, tin, copper, zinc, and magnesium in these separate chambers and then sewed, sewed the you know, rabbit back up and mated it and to see what happened. And he discovered that the tin, silver, and magnesium um, didn't do anything. So there were baby bunnies in those uteruses but the copper and the zinc ones did not produce any bunnies. So it was like, aha, okay, copper has this anti-fertility effect. And this is something that we can use for, uh, to add to the, to the IUD in order to enhance this anti-fertility effect. So yeah, that's how um, the modern IUD started as basically a population control device that would take control away from um, women's ability to make decisions about basically having children. Now let's switch to the global north for a second. And I have a question about have copper IUDs enhanced lovemaking for women in the US? Hmm, maybe we can all ask the audience <laughs> that question. <laughs> Anybody? I mean, <laughs> I mean, like if if zapping the head off of sperms appeals to you, then maybe, you know, that would definitely have enhanced your uh, love. Uh, but I, okay, I'm just, I'm just kidding. All right, so um, I use... IUDs were introduced to American women during what's called the sexual revolution, right after when the um, right after the birth control pill became available to to women through doctors, and because Roe v. Wade had not passed at that point yet, abortion was illegal, and women were desperate, really desperate, to 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 get get their hands on some reliable birth control method um, in order to be able to have sex without having to worry about pregnancy. And so IUD came out several uh, years after the pill and they were enthusiastically received by women and physicians. Um, so, you know, yes, yes, perhaps uh, at that time, it enhanced lovemaking for young, especially um, young college women were getting IUDs at, at the time because colleges started to have their health centers provide um, contraceptives. But unfortunately, a very greedy company 
aggressively marketed a, a faulty device called the Dawkin Shield, which ended up um, killing at least 15 women, uh, causing severe infections in the uterus, and leaving a lot of these young women infertile. And this was followed by huge litigations, class action lawsuits in the 1980s. So all the pharmaceutical companies got scared and pulled off all their IUDs from the market. So it, it's really in the last 15 years or so that the IUD came back to the American market and has become um, available to you. So, you know, no contraceptive is, is perfect for everybody. So for some people, maybe the copper tea is a great choice. Uh, it's convenient, it's cheap because it lasts for 10 years. Um, but for some, some people, they don't like the side effects. It might increase pain and cramping and things like that. Uh, but I guess I would venture to say that for people who who like the, the copper IUD, you know, it probably does enhance their, their lovemaking. Granted that, that the relationship <laughs> itself is also, you know, a good loving one. <laughs> now, my last question is this. You write about historically, science has responded to the political climate surrounding reproductive technology. What can we learn from history to inform what's happening today, given, given the overturning of Roe v. Wade? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, when Donald Trump announced that he was going to overturn Obamacare, a lot of women reportedly ran to, to, to Planned Parenthood to try to get an IUD because they feared that the pill might become unaffordable. And now that Roe v. Wade has been overturned, contraceptives are even you know more important for us to 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 try to protect. Because um, I have seen something similar happen in the history of the IUD. This was during the 1980s. The conservatives who were frustrated that Roe, Roe v. Wade passed and they they could do nothing about limiting abortion in the US, they turned over, turned their eyes to overseas and they, um, the United States uh, passed this thing called the global gag rule. So this is an executive order under Ronald Reagan that says that no US dollars can be used to support overseas organizations that not only perform abortion, but even provide information about abortion. So that this is why it was called the gag rule because you can't even you know talk about it. But it hurt a lot of um, organizations that were providing reproductive health care to women in the global south. And right after this happened, the conservative leaders, the, the re religious leaders, uh, came after IUDs and pills saying that those were also uh, abortifacients. They abort um, fertilized eggs. And along with that, some conservative physician science, scientists started to produce some articles published in scientific journals that says that scientifically they found or it suggests that uh, IUDs prevent the implantation of the fertilized egg, and therefore physicians should uh, inform their their clients about it. And so, so, so it's going to happen again after. Okay, the abortion has been limited now. Some conservatives are going to come after the abortion pill, of course, and also contraceptive methods, uh, trying to frame them as also abortive facients. And you, we might see some sort of scientific accounts about that um, because science is not completely value neutral. Uh, there's political intent sometimes, and there's also 
unspoken assumptions behind the research and studies that they do. Um, so we're hoping that some of the uh, reproductive rights supporter researchers will produce scientific reports that say, you know, these are contraceptive methods and not abortive methods. But in actuality, you know, looking through history, science cannot be the arbiter when it comes to really politically drenched problems like this. So what we need to do, I think, is that we need social and political activism that um, go against the tide and try to protect the reproductive freedom of women who don't want to have children and also women who want to have children um, to be able to have them and raise them with enough resources and love, Aphrodite. Thank you. It's a, a wonderful way to end on the tenets of reproductive justice, the right to have children, to not have children, to raise them in a healthy environment. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. So that was fun. <laughs> you know, I like introducing you to my friends. You know, it's like getting to know me in a different way. And I'll, I will admit, it is sometimes a little bit emotionally overwhelming to think about how we're going to repair the things that we need to do. I mean, maybe we should, we should just be friends. Like, we're friends. Maybe we, maybe we should just be friends. Aphrodite, we can't just be friends. We're past that. I mean, <laughs> uh, we, could go to, we could go to brunch. I mean, are you sure? There's so many things that we would have to do to fix things. <laughs> I mean, listen, there'd be so many things we have to do. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, are you, I mean, what, what are you thinking? I mean. Baby, I know we can change. We have to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, change, I mean, I don't have all, but I don't have all the answers. I mean, I will admit that since we last saw each other, I have been scoring the earth to ask people what they think that we should do, what kind of changes we should do. Do you want me to share them? I mean, for one, copper is 100% recyclable. Copper thieves know this, so do supply chain analysts and environmentalists. So why don't we recycle all of our copper? I mean, we're up against transnational mining corporations who receive greater profit from extracting and refining and the enormous government subsidies. So to counter that, we need stronger policies that prioritize communities and the planet in the form of incentives for recycling, laws that increase corporate accountability, better oversight in the global electronics industry, and stronger standards in how minerals are traded on the stock market. We need to support the development of sustainable and ethical mining techniques. So my colleague, Antoine Eleanor, who's a professor of metallurgy at MIT, is pioneering, pioneering a new way to refine copper and reduce toxic emissions, a process referred to as electro-winning, which I like to think of as the name of our playlist at our matrimony. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> In the US, we need to reform the 1872 mining laws which haven't kept a pace with significant changes to either mining technologies or the remaining mining deposits. And since their inception, these mining laws have prioritized corporate interests, enabling them to override indigenous communities' rights and sovereign tri treaties. So classic. 
Following is a short video about a campaign to block a copper mine that would be located 70 miles east of Phoenix on what is now a historic site and home of the San Carlos Apache tribe. The Chilpichuk M is how you say oak flat in Apache. Um, it's the home of the oak trees. We believe that our creator, Yosin, touched this place, and that it's a corridor uh, to the next world. So clad is really the um, cornerstone of our religion. This is a spiritual place for us to come every day. How can we practice our ceremonies in a crater? You know, our food that nurtures us and our babies are gonna be gone. Our shelter, our yucca, everything that we use from our shoelaces to how we wash our hair to the stones we use for our prayers and our ceremony are all a part of this land. We are surrounded by sacredness by standing here and it's gonna be gone forever. Eventually, our religion will go with it. So the proposed copper mine called Resolution Copper would be owned by Rio Tinto, who's the same corporation that owns the Bingham Mine who operates the mine where a copper IUD is likely coming from. And oops, it looks like Rio Tinto forgot they'd signed on to FPIC, which is the Free and Prior Informed Consent, which is a human rights framework that involves iterative consent building between mining corporations and communities with resources. So this is the highest profile mining, anti-mining campaign going on in the country today. And you'll hear about that campaign again in spring, March, the week of tw the March 20th, when the lawsuit led by the Apache Stronghold with Center for Biological Diversity and a broad coalition will be revisited in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. But baby, I think that we need a more fundamental shift to better understand who we are. You know, I was talking with a girlfriend the other day, and she had some interesting advice. Uh, let's see if she, we can call her up and get her to talk about it. So while we're calling her up, I'll read her bio. So, Patricia Solis from the Maliseet Nation at Tobique, New Brunswick, Canada, is the executive director of the Maliseet Nation Conservation Council which addresses how the watershed, aquatic relations, and marine life connect to issues like climate change and extraction impacting biodiversity loss. Patricia is a regional, national, and transborder leader, increasing the participation of indigenous communities in decision-making processes. She was an MLK scholar at MIT, and I had the pleasure of co-teaching a class with her on mineral extraction. Patricia? Hi! How are you? Very good. How are you, my beautiful Aphrodite? Oh, you know, I'm doing great. And you know, I I have, you know, um, you know, I was talking with you the other day about um, you know, who and I was hoping that you would talk with us about, you know, that thing you were talking about in two I'd sing. You don't talk about the other thing. You bet, you bet, you got it. <laughs> so two I seeing is something that was, the term was coined by a very wise Mi'kmaq elder who comes from Mi'kmaq territory, which is uh, neighbors to ours, Wollastigwe territory. And his name is Elder Albert Marshall and he came up with two-eyed seeing as a way of encouraging people to balance 
how they see the world and especially how those in academic circles or science circles combine with indigenous traditional knowledge in order to understand what they're seeing and how they're perceiving the world. And so two-eyed seeing is a very powerful tool that can help us understand our relationship to everything and everyone around us. I mean, I love that idea of, you know, well, if you have one eye, you're not getting the full depth, but with two eyes, you're getting the depth perception. You kind of can relate yourself in relationship to space and the land and people and other, you know, align yourself appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Patricia, um, any remaining um, like last words of advice for us? I just really wanted everyone to connect with the spirit of copper and to connect with all the living world around us. And I actually wanted to, as I'm holding my eagle fan, as I'm talking with you, Aphrodite, I would like to offer a little bit of a song in honor of you from my territory. And I will sing it as a way to honor you, honor the copper, honor the fact that our indigenous women have always had an incredibly strong an important relationship to copper since time immemorial. wasn't always a goddess. I was once a um, tiny mouse. Mortal. I was once a mortal, <laughs> like you. And what transformed me is that one day I was going through my medical files and I found information about my copper IUD and I realized I knew nothing about this piece of technology in my very own snatch. And I decided to learn more about where it came from and what's at stake. And so it's this journey to learn about the natural history of copper <laughs> that has transformed me. The philosopher Giorgio Agamben writes about the alchemical work, the opus alchemicum, the transformation of metals occurs hand in hand with the transformation of the subject. The care of the self necessarily passes through an opus or artwork. It inextricably implies an alchemy. So thank you all for this alchemical evening. I hope it has transformed you. And on to the Electro Winnick after party. Thank you.